evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to our discussion today to discuss understanding the Garden of Cascade, a tool to help and aid in the black community. So this discussion was born out of um, the release of the Garden of Cascade, which looked at people who were diagnosed HIV positive and how many of those people subsequently were linked to medical care, retained in medical care, and ultimately virally suppressed. And we're in an age now where both New York City and the federal government are saying that we have the tools we need to end the AIDS epidemic looking at the Garden of Cascade as a resource. So what we wanted to do in programs with the help of um, GMHC's CAB and also our community partners and our communications department is have a discussion with selected groups of stakeholders to discuss, do we really have the tools we need to end the HIV AIDS epidemic? And if we do, what are those tools? So that's what the conversation today is going to focus on. And before I introduce the panelists, I just wanted to introduce Janet Weinberg. Is she? Oh. Janet is here, and she is the Interim Chief Executive Officer, also um, our Chief Operating Officer. So you should do it right, right? <laughs> I um, just wanted to say thank you for all of you coming today or tonight. This should be both a very interesting and extremely important panel. We are finally starting to talk about the real possibility of coming to an end of the AIDS epidemic. And the only way that we're ever going to be able to use those words is if we take the course that you're about to see tonight that we have to do to make this epidemic find the end. We won't end AIDS, but we can bring down the New York State numbers to below epidemic proportions, and we're gonna tell you tonight how that can happen. And before I introduce our illustrious panel, I just want to let you know that towards the end of the discussion this evening, we're going to be passing around a survey that we would really, really like for you to complete, and we really would like your feedback. Um, on the Garden of Cascade, what interventions or what things do you think we can do that we are not currently doing that can help bring the rate of new HIV infections down? So without further ado, we have our illustrious panel. And to my right is Demetrius Thomas. He's an attorney and he is a policy associate in GMHC's policy department. We, we have Dr. Julie Myers, who is the director of, uh, the interim director of HIV prevention at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We also have Ms. Stephanie L who is a consumer and a recently elected vice chair to our client advisory, consumer advisory board. So let's give her a hand. She's only the second woman in the history of the CAF to hold that position. Wow. You better work with Shella <laughs> right, This gentleman needs no, uh, no introduction, but I will do my best to introduce him. He's a longtime activist, a longtime advocate, a longtime supporter of GMHC, and he is currently the vice, uh, the, co the, the chairperson of the community uh, advisory board, Mr. Manny Rivera. And then we have Ms. Ingrid Floyd, who a lot of you also know, and she is the executive director at Iris House. And last but certainly not least is someone a lot of you also know. We have Dr. Michelle Sabetis. And <laughs> tell me, Bonnie, say it one more time. Sabetis. And she's a medical doctor at Mount Sinai Medical Center.
Center, who we love deeply. Dr. Dimitri also works there as well. So welcome our panelists. And we are going to. So the way it's going to work tonight is each of the panelists will have about seven minutes to um, talk to you about what they see as um, understanding the Garden Cascade and how we can utilize this tool to reduce new HIV um, infections in New York. And then we will open it up to your questions. Andrew, you are not taking that picture right now. <laughs> Um, so we will start off with to meet with Dr. Sabetis. Oh, okay. Since she's right. There we go. Good evening, everyone. Do I need the mic? Yes. yes. Yes, I do. Okay, first I want to actually thank everyone for inviting me here. I think this is a very important topic and discussion, and more important that it involves the community. Many times we have researchers at the table or people who don't look like us, or necessarily come from the community. And I think there are holes in the pipeline that actually need help, but need help from everybody, not trickle down. So I put together just a few slides. The presentation will do about seven minutes of just talking, but uh, I'll go through these slides quickly. So some of it is restating the obvious, but sometimes it's good to hear and see numbers. Uh, people who pay the grants that, that fund the research, that fund GMHC, work with numbers. So it's good to know. So HIV here in the United States, just over 1 million people, about 1.2 million people are infected. So that's a fraction of a percent, about one third of 1% of everybody in the United States is HIV positive. Unfortunately, anywhere from 20 to 25, so about one in four of all those people infected do not even know that they're positive. And it's people who do not know that they're positive who are more likely to spread the disease. When people get tested and know their status, Irregardless of if they go into care and start medicines, they are less likely to spread infection. So getting people tested to know their status is the first step and the easy step and one that we can work on. About half the people living in the United States, about half the people who are HIV positive in the US are black, and that's disproportionately high. So black people only make up about 13% of the population. So if all things were equal, black people would only make up about 13% of the epidemic. 13 does not equal 47. All right. Uh, still predominantly uh, a disease of men, but if you think about it, I'm, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to remember when actually uh, only about 7% of those infected were men. So now it's around 25 to 27% of everyone who's infected are women. That number is edging down a little bit, but it's still disproportionately high for women of color. Next slide. I always like this slide. So Dr. Al Sadr, she's up at Harlem Hospital in Columbia now. About three years ago, a lot of the data out uh, coming from Washington, D.C., who actually had a massive project to determine how many people in Washington, D.C. were positive. And the percent was about 3% of everybody who lived in Washington, D.C. were HIV positive. So if you remember, I said only about a fraction of a percent around the country. The rate in D.C. was about 10 times as high. Dr. Alsada actually put this slide together and said, if you think it's bad in general, look if you can actually compare it to sub-Saharan Africa, where the virus is endemic. Some of the rates of HIV in certain populations in the US outpace those in Kenya, Nigeria, and Rwanda. And if you look to the, the blue on the, on the left, the tallest bar is New York City, uh, men who have sex with men. And the second tallest bar is Washington, D.C., just black men. Incredible. So that's outpacing almost 20 times the national average. Next slide, please. Women aren't having such a great time either. So especially women of color here in the United States, uh, the, out of the top 10 leading causes of death for all ages of all women, HIV does not appear on the chart as top 10 list for white women at all, at any age. Unfortunately, it's still in the top five for women uh, from the age, black women from the age of 18 to 45. That's unacceptable, especially now that we have good medicines, rapid testing, and um, the rate of diagnosis is actually 40 times that of white women. Next slide. So in a nutshell, the things that we really have to keep in mind is that it doesn't have to be like this. It's not 1983 anymore, right? So now that we have good medicines, I can get people down to one pill once a day. 
That's better than treating diabetes or blood pressure, right? Mm -hmm. So they're good medicines, better side effects or nil, right? And really extending quality of life, not just years of life, but quality of life. This is unacceptably high in these numbers. Uh, next, you know, what are some of the reasons? You can't really fix the problem or you know, plug the holes in the pipeline until we really look at what are some of the main things that consistently have been shown, not just in my mind, but actually in research and papers. I think um, you know some of the things is you know lack of recognition of what my partner is doing. You know, don't ask, don't tell. But you know, how easy is it to ask if you know you've got thrown out of your house or you can't pay the bills or the person that you're living with is taking care of everything? How easy is it to negotiate problems? You know, things you have to think about. Uh, STDs. So there was a study. You know, you know, there's been rises of of uh, syphilis and other sexually transmitted diseases. So where one goes, HIV usually follows. Oftentimes, people can leave a clinic and not get tested for the other. Uh, that shouldn't be happening. Actually, in Bel you know, I, I was at Bellevue and NYU for 10 years. I've just moved to Mount Sinai uh, within the last month with some of my patients. <laughs> uh, we, did a, we have a, a TB floor, right? So we have a floor of patients who have TB from all over the world, down south, uptown, down to, so one of the reasons why TB is still around, you know, we almost eradicated TB before the 1980s, well, it was HIV, you know? Poor immune systems couldn't really keep track of this, this bacteria. So it would make sense that if someone has TB, they should automatically be tested for HIV, similar to syphilis. Even in our own floor in Bellevue, a few years ago, we found that all the patients with TB hadn't even been approached about HIV testing. That's a problem with doctors and doctors' attitudes or just not thinking about it. You have to treat the whole person, not just one thing. I think uh, incarceration, I think it's coming more into the, the dialogue over the last five years uh, or so. Uh, there's a great book by Michelle Alexander. It took me a long time to read it, but I did. It was really talking about the difference incarceration has made, even since post-Civil War to now, in terms of not just empowerment of people, but all the other social effects that it has. In fact, the, well, I have a few other slides talking about HIV and incarceration and how it intermixes with what's called social and sexual networks. When there are fewer people around to have sex with, or when you're less likely to leave your community for anything, for school, for jobs, for anything, People do everything in the same zip code. When there are high rates of HIV in your zip code, you are more at risk by definition. 